Good afternoon, everybody. I um, was Marie Antoine, I'm the chair for this evening, and I'm the rapporteur for the rights of persons of African descent, and also the rapporteur for indigenous peoples. To my right, I have Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, a former president of the commission, who is a rapporteur for migrant uh, persons. And we also have Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz, who is a rapporteur for the rights of children in the commission. This is a special uh, event for us because my rapporteurship on the rights of persons of African descent has uh, convened this hearing uh, enable us to, to, to find out a bit more about criminal justice system and issues of race uh, in the United States and specifically a theme that we are working on and we are very eager to get the information. So I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome our uh, the state of the United States. Thank you for being with us, joining us here today. And also to welcome our participants, uh, Barbara Anwin, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law, uh, of the LCCUL, ACLU, Niaz Kazravi, Criminal Justice Program, NAACP, Brian Stevenson, New York University School of Law, American Bar Association, Criminal Justice Section. Uh, for those of you who are new to the process, each of side would have uh, 20 minutes to speak in the first instance, you divide up however you mu much you want. We're usually very strict with time, um, and I will have some cards to remind you. After that, we will have some comments from the commissioners, a short period of comments, and perhaps about five minutes after that to respond to the comments or questions that may arise. So let's start uh, with the petitioners. Thank you. Uh, let me just, I don't think anybody needs translation for this one, no. English for this one. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Barbara Arnwein, and I am the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization established over 50 years ago at the behest of President John F. Kennedy. Our mission is to involve the private bar in providing pro bono legal services to eliminate racial discrimination and to secure through rule of law equal justice under law. I would first like to commend the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for holding this hearing for your statement that you released uh, recently and undertaking to examining these critical and pressing issues related to race and the criminal justice system in the United States. I especially thank Commissioner Rose Marie Bell Antoine for undertaking a forthcoming thematic report for the commission on this topic. I hope this and my colleagues' testimony today will aid the commission by shedding light on some of the most pressing issues in the American criminal justice system. With 2.3 million people behind bars, the United States criminal justice system is one of mass incarceration, a phenomenon which is historically and globally unprecedented. The most distinguishing characteristic of this system is that it has been disproportionately inflicted upon people and communities of color with severe and devastating consequences. From the first police stop through criminal charge, trial, sentencing, prison, and after release, individuals of color are treated differently and far worse than their white counterparts. Today, I would like to draw the Commission's attention to two aspects of this system, policing and felony disenfranchisement. We have submitted a full written statement, and I hope that will be considered separately. As the Commission is aware, on August 9, 2014, Michael Brown, an 18-year-old unarmed black man, was shot by Darren Wilson, a white police officer in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. Instead of having their complaints and concerns heard, Lawful protesters have been met with a harsh and militarized response by local and state police forces. They have been jailed without cause, beaten unconscious, blinded by tear gas and pe pepper spray, and have their human and constitutional rights violated every day with all kinds of pronouncements of new policies on curfews, on keep moving, whatever that people have had to litigate time and time again. This, sadly, this is not the first time and it will not be the last time that police abuse targeting communities of color and unlawfully killing unarmed black men or suppressing lawful protests will occur because this experience has become the new normal throughout the United States. 
Policies like stand your ground and broken windows policing have been deployed predominantly against communities of color, resulting in the criminal, the systematic criminalization of communities of color. Young black men like Michael Brown comprise the lion's share of those entering the criminal justice system, but they're not alone as black women are also subjected to the same realities. Following the shooting, national groups came up with a unified statement on police reform, which calls for everything from the collection of data to the implementation of an updated federal guidance on rates, on the use of race by law enforcement, the application of the guidance to state and local police, closing the loopholes on border and other national security uh, using racial profiling, establishment of an independent commission to review police tactics and the demilitarization of equipment used by local law enforcement. We also want to see uh, racial bias training and other programs to reduce prejudice. We want to see the required use of body-worn cameras or videotapes and police vehicle dash cam cameras and independent court march, uh, monitors. The last thing on felon disenfranchisement, an estimated 5.85 million Americans are denied the fundamental right to vote because of felon conventions, because of dis uh, stark disparities in arrests and conviction rates, 2.2 million of these are black citizens, or about 7.7% of voting age African Americans compared with 2.5% of the general public. Unfortunately, each state has its own ability to pass its own criminal disenfranchisement laws, and notably the states with greater non-white prison populations are more likely to ban convicted persons from voting than states with proportionally fewer non-whites in the criminal justice system. In closing, the right to vote and the right to be free from discrimination have long been recognized in the international system. It bears no relation to the purposes of criminal punishment and permanently isolates the individual from the democratic process. The sheer number and rate of disenfranchisement of African Americans due to criminal convictions in light of the disparities is properly the concern of this commission and a threat to human and civil rights of all Americans. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for calling this very important hearing and inviting us here today to share with you the NAACP's position on problems that are currently facing racial and ethnic minorities here in the United States. I'm here specifically addressing the insidious and all too prevalent pro problem of racial profiling by law enforcement officials in our country, as well as some much needed remedies. My name is Hillary Shelton, and I'm the director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau and Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy. The NAACP currently has more than 200, 200 2,200 membership units throughout the United States with over 500,000 card carrying members. Many NAACP units report receiving hundreds if not thousands of complaints of racial profiling from constituents each year. For the record and to avoid confusion, the operational definition of the term racial profiling means the practice of law enforcement agents or agencies relying on race, ethnicity, national origin, or religion as a pretext for traffic stops or otherwise detaining them on the streets, in airports, on our nation's highways, byways, and the like. Further, racial profiling also means using race, ethnicity, national origin, or religion when a law enforcement agent or agency decides the scope and substance of law enforcement activities following the initial investigatory procedure. Sadly, racial profiling is being used by all levels of law enforcement. Local, state, and federal agents have been shown to use racial profiling as a means of policing. The fact that racial profiling is still a common tactic among so many law enforcement agencies is frankly startling given that, we <clears throat> that it has been proven to be an inefficient, offensive, and counterproductive tool. Racial profiling leads to entire communities losing confidence and trust in the very men and women who are meant to be protecting and serving them. As a result of racial profiling practices, it becomes much harder for law enforcement, even those who do not engage in racial profiling, to do their jobs to prevent, investigate, prosecute, or solve crimes. The majority of U.S. law enforcement officers are hardworking men and women whose concerns for safety of those that they have charged with protecting and serving is often paramount, even when their own safety is on the line. However, it is when even one of their colleagues engages in racial profiling, whether it be conscious or subconscious, that the trust of the entire community can and will be lost. There are a number of, of recommendations we would give you to try to address these concerns, beginning with first clearly defining racial profiling. That's the most important piece. There's an awful lot of confusion along those lines. Secondly, we must collect data. We must make sure that all law enforcement is data driven, but it's amazing to us that some law enforcement agencies actually move to prevent even the collection of data. 
thirdly, we must make sure that every citizen has a private right of action. That is, if indeed they're being attacked to find the offensive practice going on around them, that, that data must be collected and provided for them, and they must be also given the opportunity to utilize the courts to move these issues and initiatives forward. And finally, we must have a process in which they can also utilize the administration of government to actually provide that oversight along those lines. With that, there are a couple things we want to raise along the way. Number one is, as we look at the challenges in our country, we know that even in the city of New York, a so-called program of stop and frisk is something that's very well carried today. Stop and frisk is simply when they utilize the taxes of stopping people just based on the way they appear and pull them over to the side and actually search their, their, personal, where, their personal effects to see if indeed they're involved in committing a crime. Interestingly enough, disproportionately in stop and frisk practices have been most often targeted towards racial and ethnic minorities, primarily African Americans and Latinos. And finally, we must make sure that as we're moving to address these concerns, that every police department is actually held accountable. Right now, we're seeing that at the state, at the federal, and at the local level, that unfortunately, there are very few police departments that have any policies in place whatsoever. I'll look forward to any questions you might have, and I'll stop right there. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Austin Hillary, and I'm actually wearing two hats uh, this afternoon. I am the co-chair of the American Bar Association's Criminal Justice Sections Committee on Racial Justice and Diversity. And I'm also the director and counsel of the Washington Office of the Brennan Center for Justice. So I'm going to talk to you uh, on two levels. One, I'd like to talk about the work that the ABA is doing through the auspices of our Racial Justice and Diversity Committee. And I will be sharing my time with my co-chair on that committee uh, to my right, Salma Safadeen. Uh, just so that you uh, are aware, the ABA's Racial Justice and Diversity Committee serves a very key purpose. We exist to examine the causes of disproportionate representation of minorities in the criminal justice system, and we develop proposed solutions to help uh, to ensure that that disproportionate representation is leveled out. We engage in activities concerning the role of minority lawyers, and we oversee the section's efforts to reduce discriminatory conduct <coughs> affecting racial and ethnic minorities in the criminal justice system. To that end, all of the various activities that we engage in are with the thought that we will help to lower racial disparities throughout the criminal justice system. But in addition to that work that we do with the ABA, we are also engaged in the larger criminal justice reform efforts throughout the country. In my role at the Brennan Center, I work with myriad organizations that are very specifically focused on trying to reduce mass incarceration and racial disparities in the United States. To that end, there are several key efforts that I'd like to bring to your attention. First, there is a coalition of organizations made up of the Brennan Center, the ACLU, the Sentencing Project, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, where, that meet regularly on smarter sentencing. And we work very closely with Congress to try to ensure that there are legislative efforts put in place to try and reform our sentencing laws in this country, again, which we think add to the problem of mass incarceration. The, we also are part of an indigent defense working group where we work specifically with the Department of Justice to try and ensure that issues that lead, again, to racial disparities, such as the lack of representation, are, are brought to bear and that reform efforts are put in place. And finally, we are engaged in efforts to work with prosecutors throughout the United States to ensure that disparities in terms of, of federal prosecutions are looked at and that we examine ways to try and ensure that fair and equitable processes are put in place with respect to federal prosecutions. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Salma Safadeen, who will talk more about the ABA's racial justice efforts. Good afternoon, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. My name is Selma Safadine. I am the co-chair of the Race and Diversity Committee of the American Bar Association, and I serve as the director of the American Bar Association's Racial Justice Improvement Project. In cities across America, low-income neighborhoods populated by African Americans and Latinos are being subjected to unfair practices colored by explicit and implicit biases and race-neutral laws that have a negative racial impact. Unnecessary fear, community distrust, injury, and even death are the result of that. As Nicole mentioned and as we heard today, prominent agencies and key stakeholders have been making positive reform efforts 
I'd like to discuss with you some of the ways in which the American Bar Association's criminal justice section and its support from other agencies, including the Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance, is working to combat, to educate, to reform, and motivate racial justice in the United States. In 2009, the American Bar Association's criminal justice section was awarded a grant from the Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance to implement local criminal justice reform using a task force model. Each jurisdiction would create a local task force comprised of the key stakeholders in that local jurisdiction who would gather data to identify racial disparities and understand the extent of that disparity through data analysis. After that, the purpose, we would propose solutions that would be piloted and measured for effectiveness. This is a data-driven endeavor. Since 2009, the ABA has successfully implemented four jurisdictions that have successfully targeted their racial disparities identified through data. For instance, we created a prostitution diversion program in New Orleans, Louisiana in order to divert prostitutes that were, that were of minorities in order to reduce recidivism. We revised the pretrial risk assessment tool and created a checklist for judges to utilize when making bail determinations to address the bail disparities that were present in St. Louis County, Minnesota. We implemented a juvenile diversion program for minor offenses in Kings County, Brooklyn to provide training and guidance for minority youth. And we implemented uh, probation revocation assessment tools in the state of Delaware. The ABA has also passed two resolutions specifically on racial justice, and we're working on a resolution to address the issues in, the, in light of Ferguson. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Thatcher, and I'm the staff attorney for the Racial Justice Project of the American Civil Liberties Union of Michigan. We thank the commission for holding this important hearing, and we wish to highlight what the commission has rightly called, quote, the continuation of a disturbing pattern of excessive force on the part of police officers toward African Americans and other persons of color, close quote. We strongly believe that this disturbing pattern of excessive use of deadly force is directly linked to the failure to hold accountable the police officers who engage in this criminal misconduct. This afternoon, we wish to highlight one such incident that occurred in Saginaw, Michigan. A little more than two years ago, Milton Hall, a 49-year-old homeless man who suffered from a mental illness, got into an argument with a store clerk. He left the building, and while standing in the parking lot, he was surrounded by eight police officers. What happened next can be seen in footage recorded by the officer's dashboard camera. We're going to show it to you, and we'd like for you to look for these officers to approach Mr. Hall with guns drawn and with a police dog that was allowed to antagonize him. You will also hear comments about Mr. Hall from his mother, uh, Mrs. Jewel Hall. So this is a picture of Milton, Rosa Parks, and Dr. High Cornblue. He was similar to his mom. He was a community worker, and he was always there speaking for who he considered the weak. Uh, Milton took action to ensure and, and promote individual rights, and that was one of his trainings that he got in working with uh, uh, Rosa Parks and all. Uh, he was always addressing institutional racism. I admired him for that. He had a mental disability that became apparent as a young adult, probably, when he was probably about 24, 25. But in spite of this, he lived his life independently. The tragedy of his death and how it happened, how they circled him and assassinated him, and. Uh, he had no idea that those policemen would do that to him.
after he's on the ground, turn him over, handcuff him, and put his foot on his back. And that's in the video. And his blood running down the street like water. And he wasn't a threat. I mean, he had a little pen knife. So to have eight people to stand in front of one human being and shoot at him four to six times and hit him 14 times, it's, it's been devastating to our family. It was devastating to the community, to everybody. To change those kinds of things that's happening in this community and other communities of the assassinations and murder, it starts at the top. When you have the U.S. government who go in and look at something for four or five months and then come out and say, well, it wasn't intentional. It has given me a commitment for the little time I have left to work with parents here who their kids have been killed similarly. And justice still has not been served. Officers shot 46 bullets at Mr. Hall and continued to shoot at his body even after it fell. And even in the face of such graphic evidence, neither local prosecutors nor the U.S. Department of Justice attempted to prosecute the officers involved. The Justice Department claimed there was not, quote, sufficient evidence of willful misconduct to give rise to a federal criminal prosecution, close quote. However, the U.S. Supreme Court definitively ruled that willful misconduct required to bring federal charges can be satisfied when an officer acts in open defiance or reckless disregard of constitutional rights, regardless of whether he is thinking explicitly in constitutional terms. In this case, a firing squad type shooting was not only reckless, but was clearly unjustified and grossly violated Mr. Hall's basic human rights. And according to media reports, as the investigation of the police killing of Michael Brown and Ferguson winds down, Justice Department officials are again claiming that there is a lack of evidence of willful misconduct required to bring federal criminal charges against the officer who killed Mr. Brown. The communities that continue to be victimized by these acts of police violence need answers to the question of why the federal government is failing to hold officers accountable for fatal police shootings. We thank the Commission for this opportunity, and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Please state. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, petitioners, and secretariat colleagues. Again, my name is Michael Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Deputy Permanent Representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. The United States would once again thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon. Commissioners, Please know that our level of interest and representation underscores our commitment to support and engage seriously on this topic with the Commission. To this end, we are delighted that the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio, Mr. Carter Stewart, is with us today to, to address these issues in more detail. We also have some of my State Department colleagues, Rachel Owen, U.S. Mission to the OAS, Jeff Kovar, Assistant Legal Advisor, Office of the Legal Advisor for Western Hemisphere Affairs, and Jay Bischoff, Attorney Advisor, Office of the Legal Advisor for Human Rights and Refugees. Before I turn the floor over to Mr. Stewart, please let, allow me to take a minute uh, to provide a little bit of background on him. Mr. Stewart was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio in 2009. He was recognized as one of Columbus business first 40 under 40 leaders to watch in 2008. He also received the John Mercer Langston Bar Association's Emerging, Emerging Leader Award in 2008 and in 2007 was named by the Minority Corporate Council Association as one of 10 African-American attorneys to watch nationally. Mr. Stewart received a JD degree from Harvard Law School in 1997. He holds a Master's of Arts degree in Education Policy from Columbia University and received his undergrad degree in Political Science from Stanford. After law school, Mr. Stewart clerked for the Honorable Robert L. Carter, U.S. District Judge in the Southern District of New York, and the Honorable Raymond Finch, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of the Virgin Islands. In addition to his regular duties, Mr. Stewart has also served on the Attorney General's Advisory Committee, a group of 16 U.S. attorneys appointed by Attorney General Holder who regularly meet here in D.C. to provide advice and counsel to the Attorney General on a variety of policy, personnel, and budget issues. 
from 2012 to 2014. Mr. Stewart previously served as chair of the Attorney General's Child Exploitation Working Group from 2009 to 2011. And so now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Stewart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and good afternoon, uh, distinguished commissioners, other members of the commission, and representatives of civil society. It is an honor to be part of the U.S. delegation and share some of the highlights of the Department of Justice's efforts to eliminate racial discrimination and ensure fairness for all in the criminal justice system. As Mr. Fitzpatrick stated, I am one of 93 United States attorneys at the Department of Justice. The United States attorneys serve as our country's principal litigators uh, under the direction of the Attorney General. My colleagues are stationed in 94 districts throughout the country, including Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. United States attorneys are appointed by and serve at the discretion of the President of the United States with the advice and consent of the United States Senate. Each United States attorney is the chief federal law enforcement officer of the United States within his or her particular district. United States attorney's offices conduct most of the trial work in which the United States is a party, both criminal and civil. Attorney General Eric Holder and all of us at the Department of Justice who work on criminal justice matters take seriously our obligation to protect the safety of all Americans and the security of our nation, to safeguard civil and human rights, to prevent and combat violent crime, financial fraud, and threats to the most vulnerable members of society, and to strengthen collaboration among government, law enforcement, and our community partners. As part of this mission, the department is committed to ensuring the fairness of America's criminal justice system. Our focus is not just on the prosecution of crime, but on eradicating its root causes, as well as providing support for those re-entering society after having paid their debt to it through incarceration. There is, of course, much work, much work still to be done. As was stated earlier, our country currently imprisons over two million people, disproportionately people of color. This situation constitutes a drain on both precious resources and human capital. The Attorney General is committed to addressing these disparities in our criminal justice system. Last August, based on the results of a targeted Justice Department review, of America's criminal justice system, the Attorney General announced the Smart on Crime Initiative, predicated on comprehensive, evidence-based strategies that are proven to ensure public safety and dedicated to the work we must do together to forge a more just society. This is not an abandonment of incarceration as a punishment for the commission of crime, but rather a recognition that quite often, less prison can also work to reduce crime. Many of these common sense reforms are already showing great promise when it comes to strengthening communities, improving public safety, and making America's criminal justice expenditures more fair and effective. Under the Smart on Crime initiative, we have modified the department's charging policies so that defendants accused of certain nonviolent, low-level drug offenses will face sentences appropriate to their individual conduct rather than stringent mandatory minimums, which will now be reserved for the most serious crimes. We are increasing our emphasis on innovative diversion programs, like community service initiatives, that can serve as alternatives to incarceration. And we are investing in drug treatment and reentry programs that can enable formerly incarcerated individuals to acquire the tools and skills they need to become productive members of society. As part of this effort, the Attorney General has directed every component of the Justice Department to review proposed rules, regulations, or guidance with an eye to whether they may impose collateral consequences that may prevent reintegration into society. He has called upon state leaders to do the same, with a particular focus on enacting reforms to restore voting rights to those who have served their debt to society, thus ending the chain of permanent disenfranchisement that visits many of them. To further ensure that the elimination of discrimination is an ongoing priority, the Attorney General has created a racial disparities working group led by the U.S. Attorney community to identify policies that result in unwarranted disparities within criminal justice and to eliminate those disparities as quickly as possible. As chairman of the racial disparities working group, I've, finished, I've witnessed firsthand the Department of Justice's tireless commitment to eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. As a working group, we have met with faith leaders, formerly incarcerated individuals, 
police chiefs, criminal justice reform organizations, district attorneys, and academics, among others, in order to recommend successful best practices for reducing racial disparities in our federal system. During a most recent meeting with the Attorney General last month, he specifically requested that our working group continue its work even after his departure. It has become an integral part of the department's work, though hopefully one day it will become obsolete. In the meantime, I am proud to say that the department as a whole has made great progress in recent years. From the reduction of the use of solitary confinement, to the expansion of the federal clemency program, to our support for the retroactive reduction of penalties for nonviolent drug offenders, to the reduction in the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine offenses. We have worked to improve our criminal justice system in furtherance of our human rights treaty obligations. On the ground level, U.S. attorneys have initiated their own civil rights initiatives uh, in their respective districts based on local needs and varied situations. In my district, for example, my office has co-hosted annual civil rights summits for all recent immigrant communities in Ohio which has included conversations about hate crimes, language access, housing and employment rights, and police misconduct. Columbus has the second largest Somali population after Minneapolis in the country, so we've made special efforts to reach out to that community by participating in a quarterly Somali advisory council with our partners at the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, visiting mosques and schools and participating in Somali graduation events. And we recently sponsored a special summit on the school to prison pipeline to educate teachers, administrators, and school resource officers regarding the dual problems of over punishing students and disproportionately punishing minority students. We had the great fortune of having Brian, Brian Stevenson as our keynote speaker. I recognize that there is more work to be done. So I think I can speak for all U.S. attorneys in saying that we look forward to the future and the opportunity to do even more. And there is no question that no more needs to be done. Following the tragic fatal shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, the Civil Rights Division was swift in initiating criminal and civil pattern or practice investigations. And the department's community-oriented policing services office launched a collaborative reform initiative with the St. Louis Police Department. As with all such investigations, our efforts in Ferguson will be fair, thorough, and independent and will follow the facts and the law wherever they may lead. We recognize that effective and accountable police departments are a fundamental part of the infrastructure of democracy. The vast majority of police departments work tirelessly to protect public safety consistent with the civil and constitutional rights of the individuals and communities they serve. But when systemic problems emerge or officers abuse their power, the Justice Department uses its authority to implement meaningful reform and to hold specific individuals accountable under our laws. This work most often is conducted through the Justice Department Civil Rights Division in partnership with the U.S. Attorney's offices. Because we fully understand that unconstitutional policing practices are ineffective and undermine the public's confidence in law enforcement, the Civil Rights Division has ramped up its police reform efforts over the past five years to address constitutional violations such as excessive use of force and racial profiling. We strive to hold violators accountable through direct enforcement and to engage in broad scale reform to build public confidence and trust. Enforcement actions against local law enforcement agencies and personnel are one of the department's most effective tools in the fight to end racial profiling. In the past five fiscal years, the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division has opened over 20 investigations into police departments to address unconstitutional policing practices. More than twice as many investigations than were open in the previous five fiscal years. In New Orleans, Louisiana, for example, the Justice Department, led by the Civil Rights Division, conducted a year-long investigation and found that the police department had engaged in patterns or practices of gender bias policing, racial and ethnic profiling, and failures to provide effective policing services to persons with limited English proficiency. DOJ negotiated one of the most comprehensive reform agreements in its history, winning key provisions against profiling from the police department. The division has taken similar action in Connecticut, Arizona, Washington, New Jersey, and North Carolina. And the department has engaged in collaborative reform with a number of police departments, including the Las Vegas, Nevada Metropolitan Police Department. In addition to this civil work, 
we have criminally prosecuted 337 individual police officers for misconduct in the last five years. The department believes in broad reform as a key tool in addressing racial tensions in the justice system. This is because we recognize that police are only one component of the criminal justice system and that racial minorities experience bias and procedural unfairness across the system. Police reform must go hand in hand with broader criminal justice reform. I would like to mention just a few specific initiatives related to racial justice. In April 2014, the Department of Justice launched a new initiative, the Na National Center for Building Community Trust and Justice, to analyze and reduce the effect of racial bias within the criminal justice system. The center will be funded through an, an initial competitive grant award totaling $4.75 million. Additionally, the Civil Rights Division recently submitted a brief supporting the creation of workload limits to ensure the public defender in two Washington state counties provided adequate representation to low-income defendants. We have also targeted racial disparities in school discipline in an effort to end the disproportionate dis discipline of minority students, which has led to what is called the school to prison pipeline. Working with our partners at the Department of Education, we issued guidance to inform schools nationwide of their responsibility to establish non-discriminatory policies and practices aimed at keeping young people in the classroom and out of the criminal justice system. These efforts show the department's commitment to reducing racial disparities in a holistic fashion. I have described for you just some of the Justice Department's work, advancing the promise in America's founding documents of equality under the law. We are proud to stand with our fellow agencies in our collective responsibility to fulfill our nation's obligations, to eradicate discrimination, and ensure equal justice for all. Thank you for the, opportuni for the opportunity to speak with you on this topic. Thank you. You're actually ahead of time. Do you, are you going to speak as well? Okay. Uh, let me just note that um, we are also joined here this, this afternoon by our uh, secretary, um, executive secretary, Emilio Alvarez, and our deputy executive secretary, who is Elizabeth Abby Merchard. I omitted to note, note that at the beginning, and they may actually have some words to say. So I'm now going to ask uh, my fellow commissioners, first of all, uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. Thank you very much, and I uh, thank both delegations for their presentations. Um, <clears throat> it's a very important issue for the Commission, and I myself, as country reporter uh, for the U.S., am um, well aware about this situation, and I thank for the information that uh, petitioners uh, have provided and the response from the from the state. I would like to uh, to know, in particular, uh, the the issue about the investigations uh, of police abuses uh, regarding um, African Americans and and other persons on the basis of uh, who have not been abused on the basis of uh, of, uh, of racial discrimination um, and I would like to post a question somehow similar than the one I posed in a prior hearing this morning um, concerning uh, avenues other than uh, uh, judicial investigations than the federal that the federal government can pursue to improve uh, this situation, the investigations. Commissioner Ortiz. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias también al Estado por por la presentación que hizo y I'm sorry. y gracias a los peticionarios. Escuchamos con, con mucha atención eh, la exposición de los representantes del Estado eh, y también con mucha atención los, los fracasos de, de esos programas, porque eso... De eso se trata nuestro trabajo, justamente de identificar dónde están fallando esos programas. En mi rol de relatora de derechos de la niñez, de la adolescencia, 
estoy muy interesada en cuánto afecta el excesivo uso de la fuerza policial sobre los jóvenes, sobre todo los jóvenes eh, de minorías o de procedencia afroamericana o latina. Y el número de desproporcionado de afrodescendientes y latinos eh, encarcelados y también el número eh, desproporcionado en, de los homicidios, y sobre todo de jóvenes. Eh, me gustaría entender qué significa Stand Your Grounds Laws y cómo se aplica. Eh, si pudieran... O, o el gobierno o los peticionarios mencionar exactamente y, y si eh, hay un análisis, una evaluación sobre su aplicación y qué proyección existe. Eh, desde la perspectiva de los derechos humanos, siempre las violaciones de derechos humanos nos conducen a las causas. ¿Cuáles son las causas por las que hay tanto, un número tan elevado de jóvenes afrodescendientes y latinos encarcelados, cuáles son las causas que los llevan a cometer delitos y por qué su número es desproporcionado en las prisiones. Y nos llevan a las condiciones de vida en sus comunidades. Entonces, quisiera saber eh, cómo hacen el, el, el link, el, el vínculo, eh, si tienen una recolección de datos sistematizados como para identificar eh, de don, cuáles son los principales problemas que llevan a jóvenes a la prisión, de dónde vienen estos jóvenes y cuáles son las causas que los llevan a cometer delitos y la atención que reciben a esas causas. Eh, desde los derechos de los eh, menores de 18 años, el vínculo con la justicia juvenil tiene que ser el último recurso. Primero, dar otras respuestas de tipo social y por último, eh, y por el menor tiempo posible, una respuesta judicial. También me preocupa los récords, que muchas veces permanecen y no se borran automáticamente y requieren nuevamente una asesoría legal para poder borrarlos. Y ya... Ya, ya cuentan con la discriminación eh, racial o, y además por el récord compl complica aún más sus posibilidades de reinserción. Gracias por la información. Thank you very much. I want to thank both delegations with the information, the civil society organizations and the state. It is very important for the commission, the information that you bring, of especially regarding what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, but not only in Ferguson. We had a hearing recently, last uh, about six months ago, about the stand your ground laws and the framework. We have Trevor, Morden, uh, Trevor uh, Martin Mother here, and, and we are really worried. So the kind of information that you can bring us, both delegation, is quite uh, crucial. Civil society put on the table some recommendations, and I would like to know if you have a specific answer to those recommendations, suggestions, or plan of action. And also, I would like to know if there is any possibility or volunteer of the state to have a working uh, group regarding to those proposals. Uh, if there is condition to what you presented and what you hear, could be a working group on these matters, and later on, uh, sent an information to the commission because it means like there are certain agreements on the table. Both of you talk about overrepresentation of minorities, uh, Afro-descendants and Latinos. Both of you mentioned that and remarked that, which is quite a crucial uh, matter regarding what we're talking today. But if we have an agenda, a follow-up agenda, it could be very useful for us. Thank you very much, Vice President. Just a brief follow-up question, if I may. I think that in the state's presentation, there was a reference to the prosecution of 337 police officers. And I was wondering if it would be possible to, I didn't catch over what time period, maybe I just missed it, if it would be possible to know that, what kind of legal basis we're talking about uh, in terms of the theory of responsibility. This was under federal law, I assume. Uh, 
what what were the results in terms of acquittal or conviction if, if all of those cases actually went to trial or some of them um, were dismissed or otherwise um, resolved pretrial, and if the petitioners have any comments about the effectiveness of this kind of prosecution as a form of accountability. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to reiterate that we felt it very important to bring everyone together to discuss this issue, to provide a forum, an international forum, for what is clearly a very important issue. And I think it's already been noted that despite the plans and so on, we continue to see the failures. And so we, we feel that we, we have a role to play. And we wa I want to just say generally that part of the follow-up is to continue to receive information, written information, and so on. I am particularly interested in the, in the issue of statistics and information, and I want to endorse what Commissioner Ortiz said. Uh, part of the work of the Commission in, in terms of how we use statistics and data is that we are able to construct, con construct uh, structural context in our jurisprudence. And without that information, the statistics and so on, it's very difficult to make a case. We've done that very successfully with gender discrimination, for instance. And um, what I was hearing from the petitioners is that not only don't we have se segregated data, but also there seems to be some reluctance um, to create it. So I, I think that's a very important point for us as a commission. It's an important part of our work. And I would like to ask the state if there are any plans um, to collect data in, in the way that would be useful to, to, to formulate uh, appropriate policy, uh, which of course would also be uh, useful for us. Uh, clearly, we understand, not just in the United States, but all over the region, that persons of African descent form tend to form, in every country, the lowest income group. And that has an impact in terms of criminal justice. Uh, so that's something, I think, to be noted. We did have the standing ground hearing, and we did hear on the last occasion that the Honorable Attorney General had some specific um, programs in place, but I haven't heard anything about them today. I don't know how far that has gone. We were hearing that there was some sort of inquiry in terms of those laws. I would like some follow-up as well, some specific follow-up in relation to that. I am very concerned about the issue of voting rights. It seems we, perhaps on the face of it, removed from the criminal justice system, but I don't think so. Uh, particularly where it is so intimately related to, to, to convictions, criminal convictions, and where we are acknowledging that the criminal justice itself is straddled with inequities. So it's, it's a, very, a disproportionate impact on a very fundamental right, your right to vote, to be part, your citizenship rights, citizenship rights. I don't know if there are any plans, you talked about reform, if there are any plans in relation to reforming of that aspect and the whole issue of proportionality in how um, you know, rights are, 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 are brought forth. Um, I, I'm not too clear as to the position, there's all debate about body cameras in terms of this accountability of police officers. I was just in Canada and I think there's already a program going in relation to, to body cameras because I had a forum. So I don't know where we're at with that as one very practical measure for accountability of the police. And uh, also, what are some of the specific reforms? You talk generally about, perform, uh, about reform in the police in terms of uh, in independent investigations. Yes, we have some numbers as to the, you know, the sort of the successes, but are there some concrete proposals on the table in terms of investigating these uh, offenses? Uh, you mentioned, I suppose there's training, because you didn't mention generally, but do we have specific programs? Is civil society involved in some of this training? I think those are the kinds of things that we would um, want to find out more about. And some of these, the commission can assist you, incidentally, in some of these um, training uh, issues. So uh, basically, uh, I think there is a lot for us to, to continue to interrogate, and we want to encourage you um, to continue to give us information and to continue using the system. We have a little more time than usual, perhaps, um, to have, so we can have, maybe not as much as I thought, coming to think of it. Uh, yes, yeah, so five minutes each <laughs> to wrap up. I don't know if you'd want the full five minutes, but uh, please, you have another five minutes. Well, I'll start real quick. Um, on a couple things that you asked uh, questions of, uh, the reason why you have a disproportionate number of people of color in our criminal justice system is because of racial stereotyping, 
which um, says that African Americans are criminals and so are Latinos. Uh, it's a big problem, but also it starts the t at the beginning with racially targeted policing. Uh, there is a new report out that I recommend to you, uh, prepared this year by the Washington Lawyers Committee that looks at Washington DC and the uh, arrest rates that goes into the racially targeted nature of those arrest rates. And I really think it's, it's a good exemplar of that problem. I also want to just note that it is estimated that every 28 hours a person of color is slain in this country uh, and that this an unarmed, I should say, person of color is slain by a police or law enforcement officer. That these are you know, serious issues. Uh, and lastly, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues, I just want to just point out that we believe three things are essential. The Justice Department must must update its guidance on racial profiling by law enforcement. That is the number one requirement at this time. The second is that there has to be strict federal standards on funding that is given to police departments that address these issues. And the last one, of course, is that we believe very strongly in statistical data collection on police shootings and excessive force. Um, let me just interject. I understand we may have a little bit more time oh, uh, because of a canceled yeah. hearing. So we wouldn't overdo it, but we can have a little bit more okay. time, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, sure. uh, yes. And then um, I just wanted to, um, you know, just also to address the question that was raised about uh, body cameras. The data is very strong that, uh, you know, the use of body cameras, dash cams, uh, do in fact decrease uh, excessive force and uh, we also, at, Hillary and I just came back on uh, Friday. Uh, we were in, last week, we were with the International Association of Chiefs of Police talking about needed reforms. Uh, and one thing that, is, that we did say to them is that one of the missing uh, elements in this fight is the engagement of civic society that uh, police forces operate too diverse uh, and too, um, uh, you know, too divorced, I should say, from civic society, civil rights organizations, and from community organizations. There's a need for community policing, a need for you know, community uh, civil review boards, civilian review boards. All of those things are key, but that's their power that's at stake. And we had an honest and, I would say, good dialogue on those issues. Go ahead, Mr. Hillary. No, thank you very much. And simply adding to that, some of the biggest challenges we have here, of course, if, uh, if Eric Holder were the head of law enforcement in every local community, <laughs> we would be just fine. The, the, the biggest challenge, however, is that even as stellar as the report coming from our U.S. Justice Department is very helpful, and we certainly support everything you've said and work with you very closely on them, the biggest problem is the vast majority of Americans don't talk to the Justice Department or its affiliates. The vast majority of Americans actually deal with local police departments with a different level of oversight. And as such, it's important that we find ways to, to mitigate, I guess, the Federalist division between the federal government, the state governments, and local governments as well as we look at the issues of law enforcement. Most of the issues that you hear, whether we're talking about, of course, um, Michael Brown, Amadou Diallo, Timothy Thomas, Sean Bell, and some of the other deeply challenging and disturbing killings of American citizens, all uh, people of color, by local law enforcement was just that. It was done by local law enforcement. And in essence, as we talk about the policies in place to provide some protection and oversight by our federal government, we certainly appreciate that, though we would like to see very much the uh, racial profiling guidance uh, updated. I think it's very, very important for a number of reasons. Number one, every uh, federal law enforcement agency that has law enforcement and counter responsibilities need that updated guidance in light of a, a modern civil uh, police department. But secondly, also it serves as guidance also for local police departments. They look to the federal government and its uh, leadership, quite frankly, to oversee and address those problems as well. Finally, the issue, and I want to drive this home just one more time, the issue of local oversight and protection and even the perception of balance between local communities, particularly those who are poor, racial, and ethnic minority, and police departments is almost non-existent. As a matter of fact, one of the real fears now as we look at what's going on is the perception of most 
which led to many of the riots, I won't call them riots, but the uprising and demonstrations that happened not only in Ferguson, but in other places. So because of that lack of, of, uh, of real oversight and power, that is, there is no, no local oversight that actually has any teeth or any power. We certainly recommend good, strong uh, police accountability review boards that are actually independent of police departments. What you find also in most of the data is that most of the oversight committees have no power and report directly to the police chief. We see that in many ways in accounting of that if we had the same power, then I could, uh, next time I file my taxes, if the IRS has any concerns or problems, I'd be delighted to write them the report and tell them exactly what I did right and what I didn't do right. And it would be great if that would be perceived as the oversight for whether or not I paid my taxes on time or paid enough tax at all. But certainly how the police departments investigating themselves leads to the same kind of problem. So as we talk about these levels of oversights and other challenges, our hope is that a set of guidances will also come down again from our federal government to provide that additional oversight and prevent this kind of perception. The last point I'll make on this is that uh, in order for law enforcement to be effective, they must have the perception of trust and integrity by the communities in which they serve. Uh, I've heard that at, from the highest offices in the land. As a matter of fact, the first time I heard it was Janet Reno. The second time I heard it, believe it or not, was John Ashcroft. And then on from there, I've heard it again from my good friend, Eric Holder. It's certainly one that carries the regardless of the administration and oversight, that is something that's gonna be absolutely necessary if we're gonna address these issues and these concerns. Barbara and Hillary both aptly addressed many of your questions, so I will just try to pick up uh, some that we haven't addressed, and I will share the others with my colleague, Salma. Um, the issue of, of voting. Uh, yes, the issues of voting and the criminal justice system are inextricably linked. Um, let me tell you about a few key things that are ongoing and where we want to see more effort underway. Uh, we are working very closely with Congress to ensure that with respect to the voting rights of the formerly incarcerated, their rights can be restored with respect to at least federal elections in the United States. Uh, Senator uh, Ben Cardin of Maryland and Representative John Conyers of Michigan both have a bicameral piece of legislation called the Democracy Restoration Act, which has been introduced, which would have the effect if passed of restoring voting rights to the formerly incarcerated once they have completed their incarceration period, even if they remain on probation or parole, even if they still owe fees and fines of any kind. Um, we are also working in a bipartisan nature uh, with um, Senator Rand Paul, who has introduced a similar bill. Um, there are some differences in those bills. His bill is not one that would ensure that individuals have their right to vote restored immediately upon completion of incarceration. He thinks there should be some carve-outs that depending on what type of crime one has committed, that perhaps their right shouldn't be restored immediately. We in the civil rights community believe that this is a democracy, that once one has paid their debt to society and have served their incarcerated period, that their right to vote should be restored. Uh, uh, piggybacking a little on Hillary's analogy to our tax system, we expect our individuals to pay their, to resume paying taxes. We expect them to resume following laws and, and being upstanding members of the community. Therefore, we should certainly expect that their right to engage in our democracy is immediately restored. With that, there are also efforts underway in various states throughout the country. Uh, the Brennan Center, working very closely with our colleagues at the ACLU, have been focused very specifically on looking at states and trying to work with states that want to implement laws, again, to restore the right to vote. We've also tried to look at what some of the problems are in doing that. And one of the things that we discovered in a report that we wrote is that many of the state election offices don't know what the actual laws and regulations are governing the restoration of voting rights in their country. I'm sorry, in their states. That is a key problem. We want to, and, and that's one of the reasons why we think having a solution at the federal level is so vitally important so that we have a level playing field throughout the country and we don't have disparate rules and regulations that exist in the various states. Uh, we think that that is going to be a key way to ensure that Americans are reintegrated into their communities and that obviously will have a trickle down effect in terms of people's involvement with the criminal justice system. If people feel as though they have a stake in our democracy, and feel that they can be um, contributing citizens, that will have an impact on whether they do get engaged in other activities. We think that if people feel that they have a stake in our democracy, that they will want to remain as key stakeholders. And that is an important link between the criminal justice system and the right to vote. I'm just gonna comment brief briefly on Ms. Ortez's interest in juvenile justice issues. 
um, the ACLU reported that national rates of youth admitted to adult prisons were seven times higher for African Americans and over two times as high for Native Americans as for white youth. The American Bar Association's Racial Justice Improvement Project is actually looking into juvenile racial disparities, specifically in Kings County, Brooklyn, New York. There we did find statistical significance that juvenile minority youth were being picked up for low-level misdemeanor crimes at a higher rate than their white counterpart who are similarly situated. At that juncture, we went ahead and instituted a diversion program to address that disparity, and currently we're piloting that diversion program and we're measuring that for effectiveness. If that happens to be successful, the American Bar Association's Racial Justice Improvement Project hopes to roll out that diversion program statewide. On another note, just to address um, the other interests in what we view as positive reform in light of Ferguson, in, in light of Trayvon Martin, and so forth, uh, the American Bar Association has several committees that are geared towards specific stakeholders. So for instance, we have a prosecution function committee. We have a international law enforcement committee. Uh, those committees all serve on a larger committee that is going to work to draft a resolution in light of Ferguson. In that resolution, we hope to target urging local law enforcement agencies, as well as the Department of Justice, who, by the way, also serves on this committee, as a, we do have a Department of Justice representative on this committee, but the resolution is going to seek to urge appropriate training for law enforcement, accountability measures set up within the law enforcement, but then also larger Department of Justice oversight, uh, diversity within the police force, so that the police force is representative of the community that it polices. So you don't have a predominantly white police force uh, policing a predominantly black or Latino population. And then, of course, addressing the demilitarization of local law enforcement's equipment and, and, and tactics, and then creating mechanisms to build community trust, because ultimately, individuals who trust the community in which they, they work and, and strive in are, are less likely to commit crimes. And so building that community trust is very important. Thank you. I'd like to uh, note for the record that uh, two reports prepared and submitted by the ACLU National uh, and also ACLU Nation's Capital address uh, a number of the concerns that have been raised by the Commission. Uh, one is a written statement on racial disparities in sentencing and another is by the ACL ACLU Nation's Capital, National Capital is racial disparities in law enforcement in the District of Columbia. Also, I want to note that the written submission that we submitted in connection with our uh, discussion of the, uh, the killing of Milton Hall also explains why it's so important for there to be prosecution of police officers. The current framework uh, is such that many people who do not uh, have the benefit of, of prosecution of criminal, of criminal prosecution of officers file civil lawsuits. But in the end, police officers are left unscathed. They don't get prosecuted criminally. And when civil actions are filed against police departments and police officers, the taxpayers end up paying those monetary damages that are, are paid as part of settlements or as part of uh, verdicts that come out of these trials. The police officers do not get the message. They're not held accountable. And as a consequence, uh, these, these killings continue. Also, we want to note that the, there should not be a presumption that uh, those uh, communities of color that have high crime rates are filled with people who are necessarily committing crimes. Uh, we note also that in Saginaw, where the Milton Hall killing occurred, uh, there had been a pattern of what were called jump outs, uh, where police officers would lie in wait in communities of color. And as minority youth were walking down the street, they would jump out at them and accuse them of jaywalking or uh, violating uh, local ordinances involving use of sidewalks, they would then handcuff them and proceed to interrogate them, uh, search them, uh, and many times uh, cite them for small violations, all in an effort to get information or to find possible bases for prosecuting them criminally. Uh, we also had an incident where we had a young man who was uh, pulled over and stopped because of an alleged noise ordinance violation because he was playing his music too loud. Uh, in the course of the discussion with the police officer, the officer said, in words that are close to a quote, I don't want to be racial or anything, but if you want to play your noise loud, play your music loud over there, pointing at the black neighborhood, it's okay. But if you do it over here in the white community, we're going to get you. All right? So many times, 
uh, minority youth are caught up in the criminal justice system, not because they've done anything wrong, but because police officers are engaged in targeting, racial profiling, and other practices that criminalize the community. Thank you so much. Well, I'll, I'll respond to as many points as I can <laughs> in, a, in a timely fashion. I don't think I'll hit them all. Uh, but I, I first want to say how glad I am to be here. Uh, and I imagine that we will be following up with many of your questions and concerns after this. Um, but I'm particularly glad to be here because of our civic societies who are also represented. And I want to make sure that the working group that I'm chair of, the Racial Disparities Working Group, engages directly with you on these topics and has a much longer conversation than we're having now. So I, I just am glad to be here. Uh, the number one priority that I heard coming loud and clear goes to the racial profiling guidelines. And in that concept, uh, we, the department, agree with you. They're, they need to be updated. They are being updated. Uh, I, I, I have not been involved personally. I know members of my committee uh, have been. I can't say when they come out you're going to like everything that's in there. But uh, we are working on it. I, it's, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, in terms of data, there was uh, your, I think your second priority was highlighting the importance of gathering data. Uh, again, we agree with you. Uh, that's exactly what my working group is talking about right now because you cannot discern the scope of the problem of racial disparities until you have the information that will tell you that scope. So we are debating right now how best to uh, get that information. And as Mr. Shelton alluded to, there is a difference between the federal system and the state system, and there's also a difference in, teams in terms of what we can do. Of the 2.2 or 2.3 million individuals who are incarcerated, 0.2 or 0.3 are in the federal system. Two million are in the state system. We do not have direct control over what our state uh, partners do. There, there may be levers of influence through funding or other ways, but in terms of coming up with the best way of, of encouraging data collection, we are working on it, and I would love to talk to you further about how best to do it. Uh, voting rights. Again, we agree. Uh, the Attorney General has come out and said that uh, people who have been incarcerated, who have paid their debt and come out, should get their voting rights back. As Department of Justice, we do not have control over that. We can uh, take a position, we can encourage, but ultimately it's up to the legislatures and oftentimes the, the state legislatures to follow through. In terms of uh, the two points I want to address simultaneously, one, uh, the interest in juvenile justice issues, and two, uh, the question why are there more uh, minorities incarcerated dis at a disproportionate rate. This is a topic that is uh, of particular importance to me. I used to teach high school, have an education degree, and I am particularly interested in uh, juvenile justice issues. There have been instances where the Department of Justice has found that there is, has been a disproportionate targeting of minority youth in schools. The example I would give you is what happened in Shelby County. There, uh, the department found that uh, minority youth, particularly, this is Shelby County, Tennessee, particularly uh, black youth were uh, sent by the school to the prosecutor for behavior that white students would do and not be sent to the prosecutor for. There was a referral to uh, the prosecutor for certain type of misbehavior, and in every instance, the prosecutor would bring charges. There was no use of discretion to determine whether or not pro uh, charges should be brought. It was automatic. So there, is, there was an instance of targeted, uh, what we felt was discriminatory targeting of minority youth. In terms of what the Department of Justice can do, we can prosecute um, violations of civil rights, and the 337 officers, that those prosecutions occurred in the past five years. Uh, they primarily occurred under uh, 18 title, USC Title 242 for excessive use of force violations. That information is on the civil rights website, and, and we, but we can also get that to you as well. So prosecution is one mechanism. Another is filing a civil uh, civil lawsuit alleging pattern and practice if we if there's a pattern and practice in a particular department of discrimination and the third which could be one of the most important is trying to get in front of these situations to begin with so trying to do preventive work whether it's training education what have you to prevent something uh, bad happening in a community such that we don't have to prosecute or don't have to file suit and that's outreach that the Attorney General has, has very much promoted uh, going forward do you want to respond to the working group? Oh, 
just just quickly, I know that there was also some questions about the recommendations and establishing a working group, and that would be something that we would have to look into more clearly. We came here as a thematic hearing and weren't prepared to answer those sort of questions. But as Mr. Stewart just addressed, you know, he, we're open to engagement. The DOJ has an ongoing engagement with a lot of these folks on these this very important issue. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Um, so you can see the American Commission doesn't only hear petitions, you know, we have a promotional role in attempting to facilitate human rights development. I think this was a good example to bring the state and civil society together. You even have something called a friendly settlement. I don't think this is quite it, but as close <laughs> as you can. And so we are pleased to provide this forum, um, and we really do uh, want to encourage you to continue giving us the information so that we can assist in helping to further these very important concerns of human rights. Thank you again to the United States, State of the United States, and to all of the petitioners. Thank you. Can we submit more information in response? Yes, of course, please. As I said in the beginning, you, we always you, you give us written information as much as you can. We continue to monitor. Thank you very Thank much. You.